morning, church. Good morning. I'm going to pass around um, two little clipboards that have cards on them, one for this side and one for that side. You don't need to send it over the aisle. These are to sign for Elsie, who is, remains in the hospital and is having her big surgery on Thursday. So if everybody could just sign, um, I'll take them to her this afternoon in the hospital. Thank you. Um, many believe that, but to him, his individual success was not really what was most important to him. In an interview, he said this, and I quote, I'd much rather be referred to not as an individually great player or someone who tore up the record books, but someone who came to the ballpark and said, okay, I'm here, I want to play. What can I help us do to win today? A lot of people ask me, what is your greatest play? What's your greatest accomplishment? And I say... I caught the last out of the World Series. It wasn't a great catch. I didn't dive. I didn't do a cartwheel and throw the guy out at first base. People's mouths didn't drop open on the play. We all want to be part of something bigger, but we all have our little jobs that we have to do as a member of a team. Everybody has their individual responsibilities, but they all have to come together for a main goal. So the most fulfilling moment I could ever have again was catching the last out of the World Series knowing that we did it. So it is this sense of teamwork that we see um, really catching hold in the book of Acts as we move through this book over these next number of weeks. It was following Jesus' resurrection from the dead and then 40 days later, his ascension into heaven, we have these 120 believers who had gathered and they were waiting and they were praying for the promised baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they weren't disappointed. 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, 10 days after he had ascended into heaven, they waited and they waited. The Holy Spirit came, we read it last week, came like a mighty wind bringing supernatural power down from on high. So last week, we looked at that amazing sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. I mean, we know that this ordinary guy had to have supernatural power from on high to preach this eloquent and courageous sermon that he preached that day, which was a testimony to the new life and the new hope and the new gifts that God gives us when the Holy Spirit is flowing freely in our lives to make us new, pushing out the old and bringing forth the new. And last week, we had Burke Meredith, who stood and testified last Sunday uh, about God's goodness and God's power at work in his life through so many different trials. And it's such an encouragement to us, isn't it, when someone is willing to share what God has done in our lives, and we're able to, to look at their life, and we're able to see that that life is different because of God's presence there. We, we know that what they're saying is true, and that it's real. Their faith is real. Their, their life is different, and their hope in Christ is secure. We're just so grateful to Burke for being willing to stand and testify. But see, this is what was happening when the church was born, that people, the believers were together and they were sharing everything about how excited they were about Jesus and what Jesus was doing in their lives. They were excited to be part of this family, this new family of believers, and it was contagious and it was attractive and it was real. And the church grew and grew and grew, fulfilling exactly what Jesus commanded when he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And before he ascended into heaven, he said, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and all Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Grow, church, grow, is what he was saying. Grow, church, grow. So how is it that this little group of 120 people with no TV and no radio and no phones... How is it that they, will, they were able to spread the fire of faith in Jesus Christ that continues to burn all over the world to this very day? So we're going to look back at the book of Acts. We're going to go into chapter 4, but a little bit of backstory first. The apostles Peter and John had just spoken healing over a man who had been lame since birth. And this guy who had been healed, he was up and he was jumping up and down and he was shouting at the top of the steps and praising God and it drew quite a crowd as it would, right? 
And so Peter, of course, took advantage of this opportunity, gave another little mini-sermon about Jesus and the importance of the crucifixion and the resurrection and his invitation for everybody to come to faith in him, which was very upsetting to the religious rulers. I mean, they got rid of Jesus because of this kind of preaching, and now it has come back, and it seems to have come back in, in full force, and so they're upset. So let's see what happens. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000, okay, 120, now we're talking 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. And they said, what are we going to do with them? For it's obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. They couldn't deny it. The guy's standing there. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. How do you think that's going to go, right? So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then they released them. And they went back to their friends, to the other believers, and told them what happened. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So how is it that the church grew from those first 120 believers that were gathered in prayer and anticipation? I mean, it was by the power of the Holy Spirit. It grew because of the holy boldness then of these apostles who would not be silenced in speaking about Jesus. But it also grew because of the selfless servant attitude of those early believers. I mean, that early church, they were incredibly giving body of believers was a, a generous team of people who shared everything. That's what the text says. They shared everything that God had given to them, which flew and, and continues to fly in the face of the message that we hear all the time that we're just supposed to take out for, take care of numero uno, numero uno, right? Just look out for number one. Then and now, and this is part of the message that Frank Runyon was talking about when he was here last week, that the message that we hear over and over again is, is that we are to get more for me, that we are always to be seeking popularity and position and power for our own personal gain. I mean, even though in this day and age, and 
many of us know that, that this concept of being a team, it's very in vogue, it's very popular at school, it's in posters, it's in company communications that we have work teams here and there. The point of all that, what is it? It's to win. The point is to win, is to your team and the real estate is to, to sell more homes or in advertising to sell more advertising, to get more customers, to get a bigger bonus for your team, to get the highest rating in school for your team in order to get more of something. More what? Popularity, position, power, possessions, more for me. And if it works out that there's more for you, well, then that just is great for you. Now listen again to these words from Acts 4, describing the early church. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. And they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. See, what was there was a supernatural, selfless generosity that flowed freely in the early church. They were unified in that. It says they were unified in their heart and their soul in their generosity and in their giving. There's a true account of a World War II um, Japanese prison camp. It's called Through the Valley of the Kwai. It is an extraordinary story, and in that is a story of a man named Angus McGillivray. Angus was a Scottish prisoner in one of the camps that was filled with Americans and Australians and Britons. They are the ones who helped build that infamous bridge over the River Kwai. The camp had become an ugly situation. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. It was, you know, looking out for numero uno. The allies would literally steal from each other and cheat each other. Men would sleep with packs under their heads, but even while they were sleeping, their packs would be stolen. Survival was everything. It was the law of the jungle, you know, survival of the fittest until the news of Angus McGillivray's death spread throughout the camp. And rumors spread about his death. And nobody could believe that he had finally succumbed because he was a big man. And people just assumed he, because he was big and strong that he would be one of the last to die. But actually, it wasn't the fact of his death that shocked the men, but the reason that he died that shocked them. Finally, they were able to piece together the true story. The Argyles, who were the Scottish soldiers, they took their buddy system very, very seriously. And their buddy was called their mucker. And they believed that it was literally up to each of them to make sure that their buddy, their mucker, survived. Angus's buddy, however, was dying. And everybody had given up on him, of course, except Angus. He made up his mind that his friend was not going to die. Somebody had stolen his mucker's blanket, so Angus gave him his own, telling his buddy that he had just happened to come across an extra one. Likewise, at every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and he would take them to his friend. He would just stand, he would stand over him and make sure that he ate and he would just tell him that he had just gotten a little extra himself that day. Angus was determined that he was going to do anything and everything that he could to see that his buddy got what he needed to survive. But as Angus's mucker began to recover, Angus himself collapsed and slumped over and died. And the doctors discovered that he had died of starvation complicated by exhaustion because he had given of his own food and his own shelter. He had given everything he had, even his very life. And the ramifications of his acts of love and unselfishness had a startling impact on the entire compound. As word circulated of the reason for Angus McGillivray's death, the feel of the camp began to change. Suddenly, men began to focus on their mates, their friends the humanity of living beyond suffering and of giving oneself away. And they began to pull their talents. 
Who knew? One of them was a violin maker. Another was an orchestra leader. Another was a cabinet maker. And another one was a professor. Soon the camp had an orchestra full of homemade instruments. And a church called the Church Without Walls was formed. And it was so powerful and it was so compelling that even the Japanese guards attended this church. And the men began a university and they began a hospital and they began a library. And the place was transformed all because one man gave all he had for his friend. See, the foundation of the church has always been giving oneself away for the sake of others after the example of Jesus Christ who laid down his life for you and me. The candles burning this morning in honor of these children God has given us to help us raise in the faith from a distance in so many different nations, that's evidence of, of the fact that the fire of faith that was lit on the day of Pentecost continues to burn, is still spreading, is still causing ordinary people like you and me to give ourselves away for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. Now, some among us can give the $38 a month or $1.27 a day to be able to support these children. I mean, $1.27, that's like less than a soda over at Bears a day. I mean, some of us can do that. Some of us cannot do that. But that's the way it is on any team, right? Some can and some can't. I remember many years ago when Don Baker came and preached here. He hasn't been here for a long time. He's now one of the pastors at King Street United Brethren. But when he was here, he spoke a prophetic word over us. I'll never forget it. He said, and we were a much smaller congregation then, he said that he believed a congregation such as ours could be sponsoring and taking care of at least 30 compassion children. It was a prophetic word. As of this morning, with these three new children, 32 children are being taken care of through our congregation. But because our congregation has grown since that prophetic word, it is obviously my hope, my prayer that in co continued obedience to go and make disciples of all nations, that more of us will, will take one for the team, so to speak, meaning take Go and look at these children whose packets are in the windowsills and pick up a packet and take one for the sake of the team. I mean, I'm very proud of you. I'm so blessed to be part of such a generous congregation. I mean, there is a lot that we have done locally, and there's a lot that we have done globally, together, in the name and the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Because of what? Because of the holy boldness of those first believers who would not be silenced. And yet there is much to be done here and across the world. Because every 30 seconds, a child dies of malaria, which is a preventable and a treatable disease. It's estimated that 67 million children don't go to school because they don't have access to school. One billion children, which is nearly half of the world's population of children, live in poverty. 640 million children live without adequate shelter. Shelter. This past week, we had three different children in our congregation who were going through some rough times. We had... Trip Carball, who was in the hospital with pneumonia. He's doing well. He's home now. We had Finn McGee, who had a four-wheeler accident, ended up having to spend the night in Hershey Medical Center, um, who is home now, and he's recovering well. And little Sarah Smith fell on Friday night and broke her elbow, and she's going tomorrow to see if she's going to have to get pins in her elbow. But, but we're, we are so blessed because... We have access to good medical care, and their parents are able to take care of them. But there's so many children for whom that is not the case. So I pray that the supernatural, generous acts of the apostles would continue th through the Upper Path Valley Presbyterian congregation. Because remember what Jesus said that Katie read earlier. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me.
Thank you, Peter.